He shares knowledge at international conferences like South by Southwest, an event apart, and the next web. He also curates UX London and co-founded Brighton Digital Festival. Founder of Clear Left, please welcome Andy Bunn. Hello everyone, um, absolute delight to be here. Um, I came to India probably 20 years ago backpacking, fell in love with it, so I'm so grateful for the Design Up crew to invite me back. I get a chance to meet all of you, speak to you, and I'm having a wonderful time so far. So, a few years ago, I spotted a trend. A lot of my friends had become, you know, the move from being senior designers to maybe being design leads, heads of design, directors of design, and sometimes even heads of the whole company. They'd finally got the seat at the table they had long wanted. But rather than being happy, they were more stressed than ever before. They'd hoped that somehow becoming a leader would solve all of the problems of experience as an individual designer. When in fact, it actually just created a ton of new problems. Problems they've never had any experience dealing with or even training to deal with. They'd fallen for this sort of myth of leadership, that all you need is power and authority to make something happen. However, it turns out that power and authority isn't enough, at least alone. Power may give you more opportunities to influence, but power alone doesn't cut it. Instead, you need to develop a whole new set of skills, which I'll be talking about later in the presentation today. As I talked to my friends over tea and cake, well, I am British, is what we do, um, a pattern became clear. It was as though I was having the same conversation over and over again, just with different people. Most of my friends had found themselves in companies that really valued design. In fact, that's why they'd been hired. They'd been hired to grow their design teams and grow the influence of design in their companies. That sounded great at the interview stage, but it was becoming really challenging. They were getting inundated by res resumes, but few of the people applying really had the level of skill they were looking for. Most people were only sort of 18 months out of a general assembly course and already calling themselves a senior designer. So finding talent was really tough. When they did find the talent they needed, they only seemed to stick around for 18 months before, before moving on to the next opportunity. As a result, my friends weren't really being design leaders. They were really just being hiring managers. They were spending like 80% of the time recruiting. If they did manage to keep people around for longer than 18 months, and build a good team, they were finding it difficult to execute. It seemed that doubling their team didn't double their output. In fact, sometimes it felt that doubling their team halved their output. The more people were added, the slower and slower they got. This was especially frustrating for some of my friends that come from the agency world. It seemed like what they were used to delivering in three months would now take nine months or longer. Another common problem my friend was facing was a need to manage upwards. Um, it was all very well having a seat at the table, but often it felt like it was a high chair. Marketing was spending the big money, IT had the headcount, and the designers were expected to sit in the corner and play with the crayons while the big boys and girls talked. And it, it's, no, it's no one. So IT have the budget. They've probably got 10 times the number of developers as you. Marketing have got multi-million pound um, budgets, and you might have a tenth of the, the resources. And so people tend to focus less on, on you and, and more on other people. And managing upward has consumed so much of their time, they were struggling to really look after their individual contributors. In many cases, they were first-time design leader, so they're having to make everything up on their own from scratch. It was really tough. And as a result, I was having coffee with my friends. They were just telling me that maybe they'd made the wrong decision. Maybe being a design leader wasn't for them. Maybe they should go back to just being an individual designer where things were much easier. Now, I'm sure we've all felt this sense at some point in our careers that suddenly somebody will come along and sort of unmask us for the imposter we really were. Design leadership is still a relatively new activity. You know, we've had technologists and marketers on boards for as long as I can remember. But, you know, like I say, we're making these things up as we go along. So one of the big challenges we have to look at is look to our design, look to our sort of engineering partners for advice. Quick sort of show of hands. How many people in your room would consider yourself a design leader? Let's just have a quick show of hands. So maybe not that many, sort of 10%. And I say leader rather than manager, because I think you can be a leader in your team without having the title. And actually, a lot of people lead just by their behavior, their attitude. 
So I have to admit that um, this talk is primarily for the design leaders in the room. You're my sort of first sort of like persona. Now, quick question, who else here has a boss? I would imagine it's more of you. I'd imagine it's all of you, to be honest. So the rest of this talk is aimed at you, people that have a boss, because hopefully I'll be showing you what good management behavior looks like. And I'm sure all of your managers are, are great managers and are exhibiting this behavior. But if they're not, this maybe give you a bit of ammunition to go back to them and help them get better at management. So I myself have been an accidental leader for about 14 years. I say accidental because I didn't grow up wanting to be a manager. No. Um, and I think a lot of design leaders sort of feel the same way. Um, I, I kind of um, realized about three years ago that because I'd been an accidental leader, I needed to get much, much better. And so I started a Slack community of design leaders. There's now about 1,300 design leaders from around the world, a lot in Europe and America, but also in, in India, in Indonesia, and, and, and further afield. Um, and one of the reasons I did it, because I wanted to learn from other people. I also started a design leadership conference in the UK called Leading Design. Again, because I wanted to surround myself with leaders who were better than me. And I think one of the benefits of running Leading Design and this design sort of um, Slack channel is I've gotten to speak to probably hundreds of design leaders over the last few years. And so one of the things of this talk is kind of me pulling all the information I've learned together to help me become better. If you are one of the design leaders in the room that put their hands up and you want to join a community of other design leaders, maybe DM me or tweet me afterwards and we'd love to kind of have you join. I'm really keen to get more people from outside the kind of the Europe and, and North America bubble. So as I said, I never set out to be a design leader. I was kind of part of Generation X, the slacker generation. Um, so I never dreamed of becoming a manager until I accidentally woke up and found myself one. Some days I feel that I'm the, the very definition of something that's called the Peter Principle. The idea that people rise to the level of their own incompetence. And that might sound harsh, but I sort of designed my company that way. I designed my company to be the least good at everything in the company. And I'll sort of explain. When I started Clayleft, I hated the classic model of design leadership. The sort of superstar designer, sort of mirroring kind of Steve Jobs with the black turtleneck, who would surround themselves by young, psychopathic juniors that would just soak up their genius. These were the design gods that wanted to be the one unquestionable source of truth when it came to design. And because of that, they would avoid having anyone working near them that were a better designer than them. It was kind of very mad men. This was a traditional approach to kind of leadership and of, often kind of depicted in this sort of classic kind of pyramid. Those high up in the organization they were able to kind of scan the horizon because they were standing on everybody else's shoulders. But the weight of the leaders ended up crushing the people below them. And this was never a model that particularly attracted me. Instead, I found myself adopting a more supportive approach to design leadership, which I later learned was called servant leadership. In a book with the oddly titled um, Orbiting the Big Giant Hairball, the author talks about creative leadership not being like a pyramid, but more by, like being a giant fruit tree. The leaders are the roots and the trunks and the branches of the tree, providing support, nutrition, and stability. While your team are the fruits, which you raise up to the sunlight, carrying their weight on your shoulders. For me, this was a much better model of, of design leadership and what I'm seeing becoming more common. The idea that you hire people that are better than you and then create a space and environment for them to do the best work of their career, I think is the way to go. So this is the model I try to adopt. You provide air cover, you provide ground support, you clear the barriers away and create the space for your design team to run and do what you've hired them to do and prioritize learning and growth. So ultimately, I think our industry is a talent-driven industry. And so as design leaders and practitioners, we need to be talent scouts. We need to be constantly looking around for great people you can bring onto the team. And it sounds glib, but the easiest way to build a team that people want to be in is to do amazing work and to publish all the work you're doing. So in order to do this, design leaders need to sort of step away from their desks 
and get out there and show the amazing work their team are doing. And this can be done just at a company-wide level. It can be done to your local community. It can be done to the wider industry. I think the best, most successful design leaders are out there being champions for the work that their team are doing. Now, salary is important, but I would argue that for most creative people, salaries are just table stakes. Of course, you've got to have enough money to live a comfortable life, but beyond that, most designers aren't motivated by money, or at least money alone. They're motivated by working with a great team of people on a great product, delivering great work for people. So if you hire great designers early on, they will attract other designers due to the learning opportunities they can provide. And that allows you to signal to the community that you really care about design. Things like generous conference budgets, support for people who want to start speaking, speaker training, etc., organizing internal brown bags, bringing visiting lecturers in, running in-house workshops and other learning opportunities will be a big draw. Also, your physical environment matters. People spend often more time at work than they do at home. So creating an environment where creativity can thrive is really important. And I'm not talking about turning your office into like an adult playground, as we see in maybe some of the Silicon Valley startups. It's not all slides and, and, and ping pong tables. But you need to make sure that your team have the right facilities. I remember working with a big luxury brand that had a beautiful office, but their designers were not allowed to post up any of their work on the walls. And they were told that any sticky notes that stuck up on the wall, the cleaners would come around that night and, and take them down. And so because of this, the design team had no space to thrive. Um, so you have to maybe, as a design leader, work on this stuff. Work, you know, you saw John Colco yesterday talking about the fights he would have with their facilities manager to make sure that the space was conducive for, for creativity. I think another important aspect is to hire slowly and not rush into important decisions. Because if you hire the wrong person on your team, they can have a massively detrimental effect to the culture of your company. Um, Steve Jobs apparently used to say that it's better to have a hole than an asshole. Um, which, if you know anything about Steve Jobs' management sort of um, approach, which wasn't very um, nice, apparently, kind of makes me think that maybe, like most organisms, companies can only have one asshole. Um, you also need to make sure you've got a good balance of the kind of people you attract. I've had a number of friends who have like, tried to hire the best designers in the world and then given them really, really small little bits of work to do. You're optimizing this single page, you're optimizing this button, you're optimizing this flow. And of course, those designers get bored and leave really quickly. So I think as a design leader, you need to balance the team. You need something like sort of 70% of people who are settlers, who are the kind of designers that can take an existing thing and extract value out of it and make it better. You probably need about 10% pioneers. These are the people that can chart new territory, design new products and services, and take things to the next level. And you need maybe 10%, 20% town planners, the people that can look after your team and put all the facilities in place, the managers, the strate strategists, the design ops people. So you spent three months and a ton of time hiring people. How do you keep them for longer than 18 months? Well, one of the biggest reasons I see people losing jobs is they were sold or leaving jobs. So they were sold an amazing culture of collaboration. But it turns out when they joined the company, that really was an aspiration rather than the reality. So your job as a design leader isn't just to kind of sell this culture, but truly live it. Purpose is important, particularly in when hiring millennials. So having a clear mission statement, a clear set of values that you align with. And rather than just having values stuck up on a wall, you need to live those values every single day. People will believe that you're doing something meaningful and more likely to stay than ones that don't. A great way of maintaining and motivating people, as I said earlier, is fostering a sense of community and collaboration. People that are surrounded by people that they consider friends are much more likely to stay because they don't want to leave, leave the side down. So trying to build like a, a familial um, sort of community is really important. So that means creating tight social bonds. A lot of companies do that through, you know, staff outings at the weekend, barbecues, beer in the evening, and I kind of kind of get that. But we also need to remember that people have lives outside their work. They've got families, they've got homes, and people feel pressured. If your boss says, come to the party tonight, we're doing tequila shots, you'll probably feel that you have to go, even if you really don't want to. 
So you don't want to make your team feel comfortable for opting out. So try not to pressure your team to do these things. And as much as possible, if you are doing team building stuff, do it during work time. And ideally, do it in a way that doesn't only require alcohol. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of research that shows that people don't leave companies, they leave, and they don't leave teams, they leave managers. So if you're a boss and you find yourself losing a lot of staff members, it's probably not because of them, it's probably because of you. I know that might feel hard to take in, but as designers, we need to be good at doing research. We need to be doing good at research on ourselves. So it's painful, but you need to kind of ask yourself, how am I contributing to these people leaving? And what do I need to do to change to prevent this? Another reason people get leave is they just get bored or boinked out. Constantly sprinting for deadlines, having no flexing resources, always sprinting to the next milestone can be tiring. If you look at the next 18 months in the future, and it looks exactly like the last 18 months, is there any wonder that you're going to think, well, maybe it's time to jump ship? So we need to time box um, creativity. We need to create moments in the company with which we can experiment. That might be 20% time, like Google used to do. It might be hack days. It might be making sure that if your team's been on a big, long, kind of epic sort of death march, that the next project is a shorter project that kind of gives them a bit more creativity. Now, I think the good designers are happy spending all their day perfecting design. They love the craft skills. They're ha never happiest when they're kind of in their tools designing. But I also believe that really great designers want to ship. Great designers want to create. Great designers want to create designs that get in the hands of their users and really be used. So make sure that you work in a space where actually you're constantly shipping and getting feedback from customers. So you've shipped. You're executing, or at least you're trying to execute a place. I think this is one of the biggest challenges people have. The best design leaders I know spend a considerable amount of their time removing the barriers from their team, helping their team move faster and deliver to a higher standard. Design systems are a great way of doing this, um, and they're becoming an increasingly sort of useful tool to increase the pace at which we can deliver. And design ops, I think, is becoming like the new normal. If you find yourself with teams of 20 to 30 or more people, you should seriously start considering bringing in a design ops function onto your team. A role, an individual, a team that can look after the way your designers work, that can improve your hiring process, that can improve your onboarding process, can make your teams as efficient as possible. And actually, a lot of the work that Clear Left are doing at the moment almost is like outsourced kind of design ops consultancy, helping teams that aren't quite big enough to require a whole team to come in and kind of optimize some of their, their design practices. Um, the other thing you can do as a leader is model good behavior, visibly taking care of the small things in the studio. Sometimes when your folks are so busy, like trash and rubbish and kind of uh, like, you know, um, sort of debt sort of builds up. So sometimes my role as a design leader isn't to sit in the big boardroom and have important meetings. Sometimes my role as a design leader is just to walk around the studio, making sure everyone's feeling comfortable, making them tea if they need it. I am British. Changing the water bottles, changing the trash. One of the weird things is I think people think that like leaders are, are above this. But your team will respect you more if they see you getting your hands dirty and doing everything you can to support them. Be a good example that others can follow. I'm sure many of you are aware of the Google Aristotle project. Google basically surveyed all their teams to understand what led to high performance. They came up with the following list. Now, all of these things are important, impact, meaning, structure, clarity, dependability. These are all things I talked about before. But psychological safety was the number one issue. And psychological safety basically means building a culture where you're not afraid to step up and give you advice for fear that you might be somehow um, negatively treated in the future. So psychological safety, building a safe space for your teams to disagree with you, I think is really important. And this can often be difficult in high power status 
uh, cultures where maybe it's not traditional to kind of like question your bosses. I've done a lot of work with Japanese teams and they find it really difficult to communicate that their, their, their bosses may be taking them in the wrong decision. So as a leader, you also need to be open to critique and not, you know, use that as a way of kind of like making your team not feel comfortable for, for sharing that information. Okay, so you've got a team you're performing. In order to support your team, you need to make sure they have as much resources and support and structure in place. So a lot of the time, design leaders end up spending their effort managing up. After all, if you're constantly having to fight for resources to justify your own existence, very little work will get done. Um, as such, it's your job to promote the value of design around the organization. And this can be done in a dozen different ways. Like I say, lunch and learns, company-wide sort of team mailing lists. I know companies that produce like a monthly little newspaper, regular crit sessions. I know a lot of people that have teams that don't have many designers might have like a little design drop-in session where other teams can come and ask you design questions. Or I gave a workshop on design thinking the other day, maybe teaching your non-design partners a little bit more about design thinking thinking could go a good way to promoting the value of design around your organization. Um, however, I think one of the challenges is designers can be very passionate individuals and they have a strong belief in the power of design and get frustrated when people don't immediately see that value. As a result, designers often get into battles they cannot win. So it's important to make sure as a design leader, you know which battles are worth fighting and which battles are worth just letting step aside. And really good design leaders, rather than constantly fighting with battles, they will find the stakeholders in the organization that they can help influence and build collaborative relationships across silos. As I mentioned, one of the best ways, I think, of, of building capability is to build a design ops team and to weave design into the governance layer of your organization. So there's lots of companies that have like stated behaviors of how you can use finance. But often, the, the design industry is a bit of a wild west. And usually, it's not the person at the top of the company that has the most design skill that gets to decide, but somebody that just has the most power. And so in GDS, Government Digital uh, Services in the UK, they built this amazing design sort of service standard manual that means that like, um, no matter how important somebody is in the company, you have to abide by these sets of regulations. And so the lowliest designer can say to a government minister, we're not doing that because it's not in the design service standards manual. So building these tool sets can give you a lot more power to ensure quality and consistency. Now, those that protect their team, the great designers, protect their team from the crap that's coming down from above. And the bad sort of design leaders are the ones that pass it directly onto their teams. So I think the best leaders are the ones that basically are shit umbrellas to protect from the shit rather than shit funnels. And you want a team that knows that you will go to bat for them. You would even be willing to lose your job to do the right thing. So I think as design leaders, we need to step up and know when to do the right thing. Now, Leadership is undoubtedly hard, particularly managing up. So the other thing I would recommend is get coaching. There are some amazing leadership coaches out there, people that will kind of do remote leadership coaching and training, and that will allow you, if you have kind of challenges with your team or your boss, rather than going to somebody in the company that maybe have a vested interest, you can go to an external advisor who can kind of provide you with some ideas about how to kind of get out of that situation. So coaching is really important. Okay. We've managed up, lastly, managing down. I think a lot of career-focused design leaders can get so focused on sort of sucking up to the bosses, giving their bosses a sense that everything is great. Well, actually, everything is chaos back in the ranch because they're not spending time looking after their team. So don't spend your whole time managing up. Um, you need to focus on looking after your individuals. And actually, general wisdom in management circles in design is you can really only manage four to six direct reports. So if you find yourself having a manager that has more than four to six direct reports, they're probably not giving you the time you need. And if you're a manager that has more than four or six direct reports, you're probably rushing around like a crazy person. So if you're in that situation, you need to get more managers, more heads, directors to support you. It's also worth noting that managing people is really hard, particularly if those people do give a shit. Designers are tough people to look after and have very, very high levels of expectations, so it can be really, really challenging. 
So you need to spend time with your team, learning what makes them tick, get into their sort of like daily lives. You should know, you know, their partners, their interests, you know, stuff outside. And one of the best ways of doing that is having regular one-on-ones. Um, so connect with people on a human level. Go out for coffee, eat lunch with them, and build this sort of like familial community. Sometimes you might need to give feedback. Sometimes you might need to give negative feedback. Um, if you do so, you need to do this with kindness and ideally privately. I find a really great model for giving feedback is um, Kim Scott's book, Radical Candor. If you haven't got a copy of the book, I highly recommend it. Um, but there are lots of models for feedback. Um, also, I think one of the things to be aware of is if you are a design leader, you can't just have one model for managing people. For some people, you need to be a coach. For some people, you need to delegate. For some people, you need to be directive. It really depends on the kind of people you're leading, and it might mean that across a team, you might need to use all of those approaches for people at different levels. Also, non-directive questioning is really important. I think a lot of leaders tell people what to do. I think the best leaders act as a coach and ask non-directive questions. So what do you think you should do? And help people lead themselves to the answers. And as I sort of touched on before, I think it's really important to praise your team. Um, sometimes the thing that, that stops you know, your team leading is just to be felt that they're um, appreciated. So I would always say to like praise publicly and critique privately. And make sure you've got a platform for growth. A lot of companies now are building these leveling charts. Really, really important for a designer to say, well, I'm here. In order to get to here, these are the behaviors that I, um, I need to get. Um, I see a lot of you taking pictures of this. This is a really old one. If you go to the Clear Left website, we've got our current um, design leveling sort of system up online. So you can go look at the blog. Alternatively, um, there's a really great book called Org Design for Design Orgs that also have an open source leveling system. The other thing I think is really important is to make sure that your team have accountability. Um, this accountability ladder is a really useful tool. And often, if you find some of your teams just pointing fingers and blaming other people, it's probably because they have a low level of accountability. The best, most performant teams own the problem, find solutions, and get on with it. I like switching this around. So there's a thing called a leadership ladder, which makes it more of a positive spin. So you have a team, and what you ideally want people to be coming to you is saying, I've been doing this, I've done this, or I intend to do this. If people are coming to you and saying, tell me what to do, I think, they probably don't have the right level of accountability. So anyway, those are my five key concepts. Finding talent, retaining talent, executing at pace, managing up, and managing down. I've tried to share my personal experiences. But I don't believe there's one size fits all process for creative leadership. Instead, it's a mix of common wisdom and tactics. And a lot of what I've said today will seem really obvious, and that's because it's true. It is obvious. However, it's amazing how few people are actually doing this stuff effectively. So just because it sounds obvious doesn't mean that you shouldn't be trying to improve on a daily basis. You see, good design leadership, I think, is really easy to understand but it's really, really hard to execute well. Thank you very much.